Hello, welcome to Hidden History, an Odyssey Through Time. I'm your host, John Rodriguez, and welcome to Season 3 of the Best History Podcast in New York State. We here at Hidden History hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. We definitely did. And now it's time to get back to work. This is Episode 26 of the podcast, and the title of this episode is Aerial Pursuit of a German Airship, a short story of World War I fighter pilot Lieutenant William Leif Robinson. Before the 20th century, civilians in Britain had been largely unaffected by war. Previous overseas wars rarely touched British shores. The First World War was to change all that. Historians have described it as a total war, a global war which involved both civilians and the armed services on a massive scale. Count von Zeppelin, a retired German army officer, flew his first airship in 1900. They were lighter than air, filled with hydrogen, with a steel framework. When World War I started in 1914, the German armed forces had several Zeppelins, each capable of traveling at about 85 miles per hour and carrying up to two tons of bombs. With military deadlock on the Western Front, they decided to use them against towns and cities in Britain. The first raid was on Great Yarmouth and Kings Lynn in January 1915. These German airships carried out more than 50 raids on Britain, killing over 500 people in 1915 and 1916, causing public outcry and government embarrassment. On the night of September 2nd to the 3rd of 1916, the Germans sent 16 airships to attack Britain in the heaviest raid of the war. These massive, unstoppable Zeppelins had no idea that on that night, they would be facing one very brave British fighter pilot who had no patience for the enemy. This pilot, 21-year-old Lieutenant William Leif Robinson, would go on to become the first person to shoot down a German airship over Britain and deliver a morale boost to the English civilians who had been suffering under German bombardment. William's story, hidden history that has remained long forgotten, is the story of a World War I British patriot determined to protect his homeland and the new form of aerial warfare that would shock the world. William Leif Robinson was born in Cork, India on July 14, 1895, the youngest of seven children born to Horace Robinson and Elizabeth Leif. Raised on his parents' coffee plantation, Kaima Beta Estate at Pali Beta in Cork, as a boy William, known as Billy, was adored by his four older sisters, Grace, Ruth, Irene, and Kitty, and his happy childhood years gave him a sense of fun. He was known as a prankster, which his parents and older brother Harold accepted lovingly, and it wasn't uncommon for Billy to ask the most awkward questions during scripture lessons taught by the family governess. Billy first attended school around 1901 at the Dragon School in Oxford, England, but soon returned to his family in India to attend Bishop Cotton Boys School in Bangalore, where one of his sisters was a teacher. In August 1909, 14-year-old Billy returned to England with his brother Harold to begin his studies at St. B's School, an educational institution specifically incorporated for the education of boys from Cumberland and Westmoreland. However, by the mid-1800s, the school attracted many students from abroad, and William and his brother took up residence in Eagles Field House, one of the houses that students lived in while attending the school. Unlike other young men of the time, Billy did not drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes, but his interests were both extensive and talented. He played various musical instruments and had a good singing voice. Easily distracted by a pretty female face, he had little interest in the mundane task of the school curriculum. Billy might have struggled with his academic studies and found the lessons hard, being overshadowed by his brother Harold, but he was a fit lad and with great spirit overcame his academic disappointments with a gradual advancement on the sports field. Outside the classroom, Billy excelled at sports, displaying skills in football, hockey, and rowing that overshadowed any fears of the inability to settle into an academic career. Although Billy had sports to fall back on, regular contact with his parents in India by mail 
expressed his longing to return to the land of his birth. Billy was homesick and missed the happy times of his young life in India as he tried to come to terms with the traumas and hardships of a boarding school. Life in India had involved beauty and tranquility, with elegant women and tall handsome men singing in the plantations as they busied themselves with the crop. And Billy preferred the climate of India to that of England, where it always seemed to rain whenever he took to the field for a sporting event. What Billy missed the most about India, however, was his mother, who he wrote to often. In one letter, Billy wrote, I often wonder if I will make a mess of my life in a way of failing exams, since he was concerned that other scholars had received a more sound, earlier education than he had been privileged to enjoy. His fears were forgotten briefly during a holiday in Russia with the Baroness von der Reck, which was so enjoyable to young Billy, he failed to return to St. B's until three weeks of the autumn term of 1912 had slipped quietly into history. In 1913, his last year at St. B's, Billy succeeded his brother as head of Eaglesfield House, his first real taste of leadership, and rose to the rank of sergeant in the school officer's training corps. On June 28, 1914, Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were assassinated by Bosnian Serb nationalist Gavrilo Princip. Austria sus suspected that Serbia was responsible. One month later, on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Historians will later mark this date as the start of the First World War, also known as the Great War at the time because as a result of Austria-Hungary declaring war on Serbia, in August 1914, other countries around the world got involved in the conflict. The First World War would see Austria-Hungary, Germany, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, known as the Central Powers, fighting against Great Britain, France, Russia, Japan, Belgium, and Italy, known as the Allied Powers. The United States declared its neutrality in August 1914, but would join the Allied Powers in April 1917. By the time the U.S. got involved in World War I, the population of whole nations had dedicated themselves to winning the war. Millions of men were growing ever more proficient at using new technologies to kill each other. Thanks to new military technologies and the horrors of trench warfare, the First World War saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction. By the time the war was over and the Allied powers had won, close to 20 million people, soldiers and civilians alike, were dead. In April 1914, at the age of 18, William longed to leave school and after receiving private tutorship, he gained entry into the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in England, hoping to obtain a commission in the Indian Army. He promised his mother that if the climate in India was not to his liking, he would try the British Army or even the Egyptian Army, with the help of a few influential friends. William's letters home expressed his new ambitions and his concerns about how his life would end up in the long run, but he showed confidence and enthusiasm for the future. He was simply unaware, as many others were, that his life and the world around him was about to change forever. On August 4, 1914, Great Britain declared war on Germany. The declaration was binding on all dominions within the British Empire, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and South Africa. Ten days later, William Leif Robinson entered the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, age 19, and on December 16, 1914, he was appointed to the Wor Worcestershire Regiment. There he joined the 5th Militia Battalion and was posted to Gigantle Fort in southeast Cornwall, where he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. As a young officer, William found life both boring and tedious. The men of the Special Reserve were bored with inactivity, and William saw his aspirations of a military career begin to diminish. He was restless to join the fighting unit to help his friends who were defending Britain, but his age prevented his superiors from sending him to a zone where he could avenge the deaths of many of his friends from school. So from December 1914 all the way through the winter of 1915, 
William's days consisted of guard duties, superintending the digging of trenches, and keeping a restless battalion interested in the routine task of the day. During this time period, he often wrote home to his mother, longing to see India and dwelling constantly on thoughts of marriage. William's desire for action and his patriotic upbringing to defend his country forced him to try every, every avenue to get to the fighting zones, including applying for a transfer to the Royal Flying Corps. The Royal Flying Corps was the air arm of the British Army before and during the First World War until he merged with the Royal Naval Air Service in April 1918 to form the Royal Air Force. William's transfer request was granted and on March 29, 1915, William was ordered to transfer to No. 4 Squadron at Saint-Omer in France as an air observer. Saint-Omer in France was a hive of activity, no boredom here by all accounts, with aircraft being tested, repaired, and flown to all parts of the war zone. The noise of engines and machine guns being tested filled the air, and William could at last relate to this environment and threw himself into his new role with great enthusiasm. As an air observer flying the British Experimental 2C biplane, William learned the art of recording with accuracy the artillery positions and map reading from the air, as well as defending the aircraft when attacked by the enemy. In a letter to his mother, William wrote, Talking of beauty, you have no idea how beautiful it is above the clouds. You have no idea how glorious it is to gaze at the earth 7,000 feet or over. I love flying more and more every day, and the work is even more interesting than it was. William was also very aware that he was one of the lucky ones not to be crawling in the mud and devastation of the battlefield below. He may have been cold and wet often, but he had the ability to return to an airfield behind the front lines of the war when his work was done. And it was not all routine patrols and severe disciplines of war for young Billy. At every free opportunity, he visited the town of St. Omer and he met the local girls who needed little encouragement to fall for his youthful and handsome looks. On May 8, 1915, after being in France for less than two months, William flew his last patrol as an air observer after being wounded by shrapnel while flying a dawn observation flight. Due to his injury, William was sent back to England and confided to his sister Ruth that he wished to become a pilot as soon as possible. On June 29, 1915, William reported to the English town of Farnborough and made his first flight under instruction the next day. On July 18, he made his first solo flight and 10 days later qualified for the Royal Aero Club after only 3 hours 50 minutes of flying time. William received further advanced training at the Central Flying School and on September 15, 1915, Lieutenant William Leaf Robinson gained the coveted wings, being designated a flying officer and second in command to No. 19 Squadron under the command of Captain R. M. Rodwell. During the First World War, Britain came under attack from the air, putting British civilians in the firing line for the very first time. At the start of the war, Britain was ill-prepared to deal with the threat from enemy airships and aircraft. Traditionally, its home defense focused on defending the coastline rather than its airspace, and with most of the Royal Flying Corps operating overseas, few aircraft remained to defend Britain. The first aerial threat came from German airships called Zeppelins. At 11,000 feet, Zeppelins could turn off their engines, drifting silently to carry out surprise attacks. These German airships carried out more than 50 raids on Britain, killing over 500 people in 1915 and 1916, causing public outcry and government embarrassment. To counter the threat, streetlights were dimmed and guns, searchlights, and observers were mobilized. Some Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service squadrons were recalled, and defense switched from anti-aircraft guns to aeroplanes. Incendiary ammunition for aircraft was developed for bringing down the airships. 
On Christmas Eve 1915, William was on loan to number 10 Reserve Squadron in Kent, one of the home defense units set up to protect London from the growing menace of German Zeppelin raids. In a letter home to his mother, William wrote, I have been lent to the London defense and here I am 18 miles east of the city, tucked away with another pilot, some mechanics and two aeroplanes. We were chosen for it because we were supposed to be able to fly by night, an accomplishment which not every pilot can boast of, I may state. Now for heaven's sake, don't get nervous, mother. The job is quite safe if one has plenty of confidence. The year 1915 ended with another letter home that gave his hearty wishes of luck and happiness throughout 1916 and all the following years with love to all. William signed this letter, I remain your ever-loving son, Billy the Birdman. In January 1916, William Robinson delivered his last ferry job, an Armstrong Whitworth FK-3 biplane from Newcastle to the Central Flying School. Due to bad weather, William wasn't able to complete his mission until January 31st, a night in which England was raided by nine Zeppelins. Of those killed, 76 were women and 34 children. The requirement for night flying pilots became of paramount importance and William was sent to his first operational unit on February 2nd, 1916, assigned to Sutton's Farm Airfield, the future number 39 Home Defense Squadron, part of 19 Reserve Squadron under the command of Major T.C. Higgins. On April 10, 1916, William's brother Harold died of wounds he received while fighting in Mesopotamia with the Indian Army. By July 1916, the Home Defense Squadron had grown to 18 aircraft under the leadership of Major Higgins and was made up of three flights. William was assigned to B Flight, and as the raids continued on England by the German airships, the men of B Flight began to get impatient at their lack of success in finding the enemy, who managed to avoid all their efforts at contact. William and his friends continually spoke of the issues with their own aircraft weaponry and their inability to bring the huge Zeppelins down by machine gun fire. It was a relief when they heard of an Australian engineer, John Pomeroy, and his new design of an explosive bullet, which used in combination with an incendiary bullet, would prove to be most effective against the Zeppelins in the months ahead. On September 2, 1916, the Germans sent 16 airships, 12 from the German Naval Airship Division and 4 from the Army Division, to begin the heaviest raid of the war on England and the capital city of London. By 10.40 p.m., the airships were approaching London in a wide sweep. Meanwhile, at Sutton's Farm Airfield, 21-year-old Lieutenant William Leif Robinson and another lieutenant sat in their BE-2C aircraft engines warming up as they prepared for a routine search and find operation. The two pilots were unaware of the incoming German Zeppelins. At 11.08 p.m. the men took off, rising swiftly into the misty night air and up to an altitude of 10,000 feet over the next hour. As William flew in the direction of London, warnings were sent of the approaching German airships to the Ministry of Defense and anti-aircraft gunners in Hyde Park were primed and prepared for the anticipated attack. The citizens of London had put their children to bed and retired for the evening, few concerned with the possibility of yet another raid. In the early hours of September 3, 1916, the first bombs fell on London, causing considerable damage, and at 1.10 a.m., William caught sight of a German Zeppelin in the cross beams of two searchlights over London. Meanwhile, in the streets below, Londoners were alerted to the drama and despite the bombing, poured out onto the streets to gaze up into the night sky. The Zeppelin LZ-98 rose to 13,000 feet with William and his tiny aircraft in hot pursuit, but William lost the airship and disappointed resumed his patrol 
aware of his lack of fuel and his restricted flying time. At 2 a.m., William spotted the huge German airship SL-11 in searchlights over Finsbury and Victoria Park. The Zeppelin was surrounded by explosions from anti-aircraft fire, and yet there didn't seem to be any damage on this immense invader. Ignoring the fact that he was low on fuel, William fearlessly chased after the SL-11, joined in the air by two other experienced night fighters, Second Lieutenants Mackey and Hunt. The crowd down below gasped as the SL-11 dropped a 50-pound bomb in a field and then disappeared into the clouds. Cheers erupted from the citizens of London as the German airship reappeared with shells bursting around the enormous fabric-covered hull, one tiny fighter plane speeding after it. Within seconds, William had raked the underside of the ship with one drum of his Lewis machine gun. The crowd fell silent, as did the guns, since William was shocked to realize that the incendiary bullets had failed to affect the ship in any way. Flying alongside the SL-11 at 11,500 feet, William fired another drum of bullets, raking the ship from end to end without any apparent effect. Turning his plane to approach the SL-11 from the rear, some 500 feet below the airship, William pumped his last drum of bullets into the belly of the giant airship between his twin rudders. Suddenly, a glow of red light appeared on the SL-11 that grew within seconds into a blazing inferno. Flying away quickly to avoid the intense heat, William watched as the fire ignited the hydrogen gas in the airship turning it into a scorching fireball that illuminated all of London. The citizens watching below went crazy, cheering and clapping in a mad frenzy of relief. Ray, a young boy on the outskirts of London, saw a flare fly high into the sky, shot by William Robinson in his jubilation, and the boy felt a tremendous sense of pride in the victory over the enemy airship. The German SL-11 fell in one huge tangled mess of burning debris, one of the propellers from his engines flying off the wreckage, and the doomed airship crashed into a field in the village of Cuffley, Hertfordshire. The entire German crew of the SL-11 were killed in the aerial battle. After firing off a few more flares in joy, William had to return to Sutton's farm airfield since his fuel and oil tanks were almost empty. He landed at 2.45 a.m., tired and weary, and as Billy lifted himself out of the cockpit, he was greeted by the ecstatic ground crews who cheered and congratulated him. They then lifted him shoulder high and carried him to the flight office to report his victory. That night was to be remembered for the rest of the 20th century, and now remembered in the 21st century as we tell this story, and known as Zepp Sunday. The following day, hundreds traveled to see the wreckage at Cuffley, Hertfordshire. The night before, the British Army had moved in quickly to put up a barrier around the burning wreckage, but not before many souvenirs had been taken illegally by the enthusiastic crowd who had come from all over England to gloat over the fallen airship. Over the next two days, over 10,000 people traveled from King's Cross Station to the tiny village of Cuffley to view the wreckage. It became crucial that extra police and army personnel were, were provided to assist the hard-pressed military guards around the site. William's very public destruction of the German airship made him a national hero. He was the first person to shoot down an airship over Britain and had delivered a morale boost to the civilians who had been suffering under German bombardment. After a few hours sleep, William Leif Robinson and a number of fellow officers traveled to the wreckage site, where he was immediately mobbed by the excited crowd. On September 5, 1916, it was announced in the London Gazette that the King of England would be awarding the Victoria Cross, the highest and most prestigious decoration, to Lieutenant William Leif Robinson, and went on to briefly describe his heroic actions. The newspaper spread the story of the victory throughout England, and the reaction of the public to the news was unpredictable. A hysteria swept through the towns and villages at William's success. Within days, letters and telegrams began arriving congratulating him on a job well done, with some of the letters containing money. 
William received over 4,200 British pounds and was overwhelmed by the response from the public. On September 6, the bodies of the German crew of the SL-11 were buried at Hunting Lane Cemetery, but not before some of the crowd had thrown eggs at the coffins. That same day, 26-year-old Frances Bamford was buried with her 12-year-old sister Eleanor, both killed by a bomb dropped by the German SL-11 airship. On September 9, 1916, King George V decorated Lieutenant William Leif Robinson, the Zeppelin destroyer, with the Victoria Cross at Windsor Castle, with the large crowd gathered to welcome the hero. Modest, quiet William Leif Robinson was amazed to see so many people who cheered him loudly as the motor car he was in hurried him to the castle. On his way to meet the king, much to his horror, the motor car William was traveling in had broke down at Runny Mead, an area in England about 15 minutes away from Windsor Castle. As a result, the royal carriage that was waiting for William at Windsor Railway Station left without him, assuming he hadn't been able to make the trip. In a fearful fright at the thought of keeping his king waiting, William and a fellow officer eventually motored into the palace yard. After pinning the Victoria Cross on Lieutenant Robinson's chest, and warmly congratulating him on his gallant accomplishment, King George V asked several questions of the young lieutenant, displaying his keen technical interest in aviation. The king was very curious as to how William brought down the German Zeppelin and was given a long and detailed account of the event in question. William and King George V spent some time looking over a fine collection of photographs of the battlefront in France, sent to the king by the Prince of Wales. After talking long and warmly of France and the French Air Service, the King asked Lieutenant Robinson questions about his father and grandfather and recalled that his grandfather, Mr. William Bram Robinson, was once chief constructor at the Portsmouth Dockyard. Queen Mary, Princess Mary, and Prince Albert then received Lieutenant Robinson, and the Queen asked him many questions concerning his achievement. Lieutenant William Leif Robinson received the fastest Victoria Cross ever rewarded, 48 hours after he successfully shot down the German SL-11 airship. This was the only VC awarded for action in Britain. After receiving the Victoria Cross, William was mobbed in the streets, received standing ovations in theaters, letters from schoolgirls, and photographs from actresses. On October 18, 1916, Lieutenant William Leif Robinson, VC, was informed of his promotion to flight commander with a confirmation of temporary acting captain and an increase of pay. He was still not flying after an aviation accident on September 16 grounded him until high command decided his faith and he asked to be sent to France. Instead, he was advised of a posting to the command of the Home Defense Squadrons in Northern England and Scotland. William was unhappy at the thought of being transferred to a northern field and disappointed at his failure to continue flying. It was around this time that William announced his engage engagement to Mrs. Joan Whipple, widow of Captain Herbert Connell Whipple. Joan was working in a Surrey post office but visited Sutton's farm frequently with some friends from her days at Bentley Priory in Stanmore. Considering William had so many admirers, there must have been something very special about Mrs. Whipple. None of Robinson's letters to her from Germany survive, but he, re but he refers to her as the best girl on God's earth in a letter to his parents. It is likely that he found a private haven of peace with Joan in an otherwise stormy and very public existence. The months went slowly for William after the excitement of his victory over the German airship. With no flying duties and only regular public relation appearances, as a morale booster for the citizens of England, he once again volunteered for duties in France. On February 9, 1917, William's wish came true and he reported to Major L. Parker as a flight commander. Equipped with a new Bristol F-2 fighter plane, 
William and the other fighters flew to France on March 18, 1917. While this fighter plane was an upgrade from the BE-2C aircraft that William flew against the German airship, its debut on the Western Front would be disastrous for the Royal Flying Corps and for William Leif Robinson. On his first patrol, April 5, 1917, William and his men were surrounded by German aircraft led by Manfred von Richthofen, known historically as the Red Baron. This man was a German fighter pilot who was the deadliest flying ace of World War I. During a 19-month period between 1916 and 1918, the Prussian aristocrat shot down 80 Allied aircraft and won widespread fame for his scarlet-colored airplanes and ruthlessly effective flying style. William and his men were all shot down and taken prisoner. Throughout the rest of the war, he was held in three different camps, and as the infamous Zeppelin destroyer, William was badly treated and spent months in solitary confinement. News of the event soon circulated to the stunned nation in England, and many feared that William Leif Robinson was dead, including his parents and his fiancée, Joan Whipple. However, the Germans allowed William to write letters, and he wrote to Joan and his parents, letting, letting them know he was okay despite being a prisoner of war. William's letters home gave no hint of the maltreatment of prisoners, nor his own problems, which frequently made his life very unpleasant. William did make several attempts to escape the prison camps, but his health suffered over time, and he became too weak to accomplish this difficult task. On November 11, 1918, after more than four years of horrific fighting and the loss of millions of lives, the guns on the Western Front fell silent. Although fighting continued elsewhere, the armistice between Germany and the Allies was the first step to ending World War I. The global reaction was one of mixed emotions, relief, celebration, disbelief, and a profound sense of loss. On December 14, 1918, Captain William Leif Robinson, VC, was released from captivity and returned to England. Already in poor health from his days as a prisoner of war, William caught the Spanish flu virus that killed millions between 1918 and 1919. On December 31, 1918, Captain William Leif Robinson, VC, died at the age of 23. At the time of his death, William's sister Kitty and his beloved fiance Joan Whipple were by his bedside. England mourned the passing of one of its most popular war heroes, and the funeral, held on January 3, 1919, was attended by many hundreds of people. Together with a large cross of flowers from his fiance, along with many other floral tributes on the coffin, William was carried to the tiny All Saints churchyard in Harrow Weld a suburban district in Greater London, England. The central band of the Royal Air Force led the procession and William's friends placed a large white floral tribute in the shape of his coveted pilot wings beside his final resting place. Thank you for listening and I hope that you've learned something new today. Season 3 of Hidden History will explore the lives of veterans of the United States as well as veterans of foreign countries historically connected to our nation, such as Britain, France, and Spain. Many of their stories have been hidden in the pages of history and deserve to be told. Pictures, newspaper clippings, and links to external articles relating to a particular episode are available on our website, hiddenhistorypod.com. Thanks again for listening. I'm John Rodriguez. And until we meet again, this has been Hidden History and Odyssey Through Time.